Modern Animism Radio. I'm your host, Laura Giles. Thanks for tuning in. I'm going to be joined today by Sherry Calvert, who is our co-founder, and Marva Maynard from our private group. And we're going to be talking today about sovereignty and connection in racism. So let's get started by acknowledging and giving gratitude to the elements and ancestors. Acknowledge the element of Earth and thank you for our home, the food that you provide for us, this wonderful planet that we live on. Uh, stability and our strong foundation and the physicality to enjoy our human experience. I acknowledge and thank the element of air and thank you for the creativity and ideas that are flowing in this really magical crazy time that we are living in today. And I hope that you also bring with you the wisdom that we can make good choices. Uh, acknowledge and thank the element of fire for power and responsibility, the two things that have to be in balance for us to practice sovereignty and make good decisions. And I allow or acknowledge and thank the element of water um, for helping us to go deep into our rough spots and to the challenges that we are facing today. And I acknowledge and thank our loving, helping ancestors from the human, plant, animal, and mineral realms. And thank all of you for being here today too. If you, um, hear anything that inspires you please consider giving us a donation it does help to keep us going and you can do that on our website at pansasati.net so sherry and marva how are y'all doing today i'm good thanks for inviting me sure sure <laughs> i'm doing well as well thanks <laughs> So we've been having some crazy conversations on the private group, guys. <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> anything tweaking you or anything standing out that you want to start with? Well, I know uh, one the, the more recent one that we had was uh, brought up by one of the members um, having to do with a uh, particular actress that had made an apology for what she felt was cultural culturally wrong on her half for wearing cornrows or braids mm -hmm. and that sparked a bit of a, a firestorm in some of the reactions uh, my piece on it because i am african-american not only only am i african-american i am born in the caribbean american african-american uh and i do have a bit of a mixed heritage it doesn't show when you look at me but it is in there and so i think i have a, a a reasonably diverse background and experience um, and perspective uh -huh. on what is culturally right or what's not. Um, and the thing that got me was, I understand that there's going to be a lot of people that are going to be jumping on the bandwagon using the turmoil that we're dealing with now, whether it's because of the, well, astrologically, the planets, the moon, or just people are on just fed up for their own personal gain and i'm not sure if i had addressed that in my response my concern was that people understand which i think a lot of people do understand people that are not uh, african-american or black or have had that experience the experience and why we may be offended if someone wears cornrows and braids which does not which was a good point made uh, made that it does not belong to african americans or black braids and cornrows are done across the globe but here in america or in the west when you tell a particular group they cannot do it it's unprofessional it's primitive um and make them feel wrong and then glorify it when someone like an actress does it someone who, who knows that how they carry themselves is going to influence people it's going to draw attention and when they do things for attention whether she did it originally for attention styling her hair that way or making the apology at this time for attention that is questionable so it is a very hot topic especially again for african-american women because I feel it, it, if it's the norm, if more people braided their hair, corner their hair, and everybody was okay with it, it would be fantastic and cool. And the point I made online was that technically African-American women or women with a particular hair type, because it doesn't just have to be African-American women, which was referred to as the threes and the fours, particularly the C's, which is a very coily hair and zigzag hair. But cornrow and braid had been done and is done 
for protecting the hair from damage, from matting, from breaking. And of course, as human beings, we're artistic, we're creative, so we do it in very elaborate ways. And so with the awful events of slavery, which didn't just happen to Africans coming to America, it happened all over the world, but this particular era in this time and this fallout from it, when African-American women or women of color or women with that hair type were told they could no longer groom themselves in that manner and show up in public or get a job because it looked too professional, it was too black, it was too um, you know, controversial, that was an outrage. At the time when it was being done, you were being told you could not do it, but then you move forward and there is more mixing and you know, uh, more cultural multiculturalism and someone else does it, and it's all of a sudden very cool. That's where some of the outrage came in. So people are really upset these days of everything that anybody does that's not part of their quote unquote race or culture. But, you know, but I'll ask you this, who can tell you what's part of your culture or race? Because like I said at the beginning of my, my ramble, I'm multicultural. And but you don't look at me and see that. That's exactly where I was going with that. So for a lot of people, the race doesn't show. Or maybe you look like you're not. Really not. And people make all these kinds of assumptions and they're projecting all kinds of stuff on you. Like you you can do this and you can do that. Or you can say this and you can say that based on how you look. And it, you could be totally wrong. So it has nothing to do right. with race, really. It has to do with something in your head that doesn't, it's not even real in many cases. Mm -hmm. Right. I think for, so I saw the discussion. I didn't join in on it because I saw it later and then I was just reading everybody's feedback on it because everybody was coming from a completely different view. Totally. Yeah. So for me, the original question was, was it cultural appropriation? And mm -hmm. I, I didn't think it was because she, well, so I, she was something she did, what, five years ago or six years ago? And she wasn't trying to feel a look or a culture. I thought she was, I thought it was appreciation, if anything, because she wasn't like another celebrity who did the same cornrows, but instead of saying these are cornrows, she said, I have Bo Derek braids, which is attributing cornrows to Bo Derek instead of where it actually right. came from. Yeah. So, That's the difference for me in that. But yeah, I think, um, uh, another thing that struck me is where to be defensive about it. Cause I, I was waiting for different cultures to come forward about their experiences with it and, and their viewpoint of it. And I was surprised to see who was fighting the hardest about it being cultural appropriation too. I well, I wanted to add something when I know who that celebrity is, when you said Broderick Wright, the <laughs> fun thing about that is again, I, I'm, I, and I'm not a youngster, I'm in my early 50s. Um, so I remember Bo Derek. So when you say Bo Derek braids, to me, I'm, I, it automatically brings me back to the memory of Bo Derek, a beautiful, was she blonde? I think she was blonde, <laughs> she was blonde, white woman wearing braids. Here's the thing. In the African-American culture, we have a tendency to name things, especially if it's trendy. We got uh, braids called Poetic Justice Braids, mm. based on a movie with right. Janet Jackson. No, nobody was mad. <laughs> no, nobody in the black community was mad. You go to a braiding place or you tell somebody, I want to get some Poetic Justice Braids. They know exactly what you're talking about. So I think the poor thing was just labeling it because she knows that she has a certain type of hair that is not 3C or 4C. It's not kinky coily. It is straight and white, for the most part, like Bo Derek. And when she braids her hair, that's what it's going to look like versus someone with kinky hair doing that same style. It's not going to look the same way. I mean, people go on cruises. People go to the, the islands. They go, you know, different places and they get those braids. Nobody's mad at them when they get back on the ship. Oh, no, you didn't pay $10 for that little island girl to braid your hair and put beads in there. Right. <laughs> right. And that's a good point, too, because people, that's how they make their money. And if people right. all of a sudden became like, oh, I can't do that because it's cultural appropriation, those people are going to have to find a new way to make their money. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And a lot of young 
people, well, particularly girls in these places, they set up and they wait for the tourists, the cruise ship. Boom, there's money out of their pocket because you're going to have people that are afraid to get back on the ship and or wherever or come back home and have people thinking, oh, no, she didn't. You know what I mean? <laughs> That's what they yeah. still say. So it has a lot of repercussion. Yeah. Yet still, I know that the conversation needs to be had. It needs to be had because, unfortunately, like everything, should, stuff should be uh, addressed. Um, it has to come up for healing. Uh, sometimes a, a wound can fester so long that we're waiting for it to pop or heal, but you got to lance it. And it's ugly and it's painful. And I think this is the stuff that we're going through. Mm -hmm. Some of it is ugly, it's painful, and people don't, certain people don't like that. But that's just like this wound or a, a bump or whatever you might consider it to be. Um, just like that, when you're comfortable with paying too long, when you think it doesn't affect you, you don't want it to be lanced. You don't want it to be talked about. So once again, if, if women can wear their hair in braids and cornrows and go to the office you know how they can look like Tina Turner and, and uh, <laughs> Mad Max for all I care. And be okay. I love some Tina Turner, but you know what I'm saying? And it be okay. And it is not a statement of you being too tribal or fierce or angry because the truth is, is that we have, we had gone through a time where we all had to fit in. One of the things, because we're on the subject of the hairstyle that set off this, this uh, controversy and the, well, not controversy, these intense conversations post one of the things you consider is now that this natural hair movement has just really blossomed in the black community it also has blossomed from what i can see in the white community him hispanic in the asian i'm seeing a lot more women period wearing their normal hair. I think the sale of flat irons has gone way down. <laughs> Pounds, way down. You know, they're flooding the market with curly. You go down the aisle of Target or Kohl's, I mean, not Kohl's, Target or Walmart or whatnot, and I see more products on the shelf for natural and coily hair, not just for black women, but women of all races and color to celebrate our hair. Otherwise, you had to go through a routine, and I know I have lots of friends, genuine friends, that are white that had to go through that washing and drying and flat iron as straight as they can get in it and putting in all this product so that the, the, the you know, that they go out and it doesn't poof up, it doesn't frizz. So it's a celebration. So we're going to have these conversations because it's a wake up call. It's a lancing of this boil that's been festering too, too long. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, some of it, as you mentioned, Laura, it's some of that's just gone way out of control. Well, and I think, too, for me, having the conversation, it's been good because it starts off as a, as a talk about hair. And really what's underneath it for me is it's just the, the desire for belonging and acceptance and permission to just be who you are. Like there's a lot of judgment on, on all sides about who you're supposed to be and what you're supposed to look like. And, and if you can just walk in your heritage in your identity then none of this has to be an issue so for example i went to uh this this is my story about racism my big story about racism i went to a historically black college and that for me was where i found out what it was like to be invisible because i was not seen there nobody gave a crap <laughs> about me i mean it wasn't that they were hostile that happened every now and then but it really wasn't that it was just really like we don't see you we don't care about you you don't matter mm. and and I had to work a lot harder to be equal I had to work a lot harder to get the same grades even though a lot of the work that we did was group work so technically everybody in the group should get the same grade because it's one project but I didn't mm. wow. yeah how does that work <laughs> <laughs> And it, it infuriated me, but it, I didn't take it personally. I mean, it didn't make me feel, oh my God, I hate myself, you know, because in the rest of my life, I had validation. I had stability. I know who I am. But if you grow up like that your whole life, then, then I could see that there would be a lot of resentment and a lot of hate and, and, you know, you people are doing this to me. 
And, and I thank God I, I didn't grow up with that, but I, I can on some level understand it through my own experience. Well, I also had a little bit of that. Um, well, I had a lot of that being black, but I will tell you, I remember in junior high school, I grew up in South Florida. I'm a transplant to Richmond, Virginia uh, as a full adult. So I transplanted, if you would say, as a very, very young adult from the U.S. Virgin Islands, St. Croix, whoop, whoop, um, <laughs> to <laughs> my little plug for my island, um, to Miami. And that was in the late 70s lot of racial tension within the, the black community and the Latin community and the community as, as a whole, but, you know, just on the, those sub communities, because that was a time after the Cuban boat lift and the time after the Haitian refugee crisis. And the two groups were treated so differently. Haitians were turned around in a war and Cubans were for the most part invited. And you heard outrageous stories of, uh, the, just stealing ships and boats and anything. And it was like, oh, sure, come on, yeah, come on over. <laughs> uh, we, will, we will rewrite stuff in Spanish for you, but Haitians, good luck with that. You know, uh, the whole family's being stopped before they can get out of international water and be turned back. But anyway, that was part of, uh, so just a little bit of history. So when I say steep, I mean steep in, in not just being multicultural because of how I grew up around different types of people, but being put from one multicultural environment into another. Yeah. Again, like you said, where, where I was the norm and the, the part of the majority, and then I was part of a minority minority. So in uh, junior high school, I was going to, we moved from one, one city to another in South Florida. And uh, I was placed into a predominantly black junior high school that was a, had a very, very inner city mentality. And I wasn't having none of it. I had never been so rebellious. My mother was shocked. I was so upset. It was hard to walk the hallway without someone thugging at you. And I'm like, well, what is this? This is, this, you know, what is this? And I told my mom, you, you transfer me. I'm not going back to school. And that's not me. And so I ended up going all the way across town to another extreme to a predominantly white, not just white, the Jewish, very well off area in North Miami Beach. <laughs> and I understand what you read about feeling invisible <laughs> because there was some mix in, but it was predominantly white, Jewish um, student body in junior high school. You know how mean junior high school kids can be. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and, and they weren't all rich, but they were very comfortable. I mean, people graduated from the eighth grade and going to high school and got BMWs and, and convertibles, not just high school, but I was like, what? <laughs> and walked the hallways feeling a little bit invisible. Yet still, there, were all, there was always someone or some teacher that knew this and went out of their way, sometimes in a good way and sometimes in a bad way, to make sure you feel comfortable, <laughs> to help you feel every day that, uh, oh, I see you. And this, this happens with certain minorities every day, not just when you go to school. And like you said, having that experience where you could be safe at home in your own culture and then you go out into the world and you deal with that is one thing. When you constantly deal with it, it becomes that old thing, which is a, a double-edged sword, that old saying, if you're a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Yeah. So as soon as a slight comes up, you're aware of it. And that can be true because, unfortunately, in dealing with certain racism and so forth, it's like you, you, you want to, or I, they say don't even use or forgive me, uh, Toastmasters training, way worn off now, <laughs> but yet still I, I know that as a person, I'm going to say you again. So you constantly are trying to filter it through, did they mean something by that or not? It's a program that's running in the back of your mind. Mm -hmm. One of the things that, uh, I'm going to hush in a minute, but one of the things that all of this tension has brought up, I go to a church that's supposed to be very metaphysical, very, you know, open-minded and, and so forth. I'm still the minority there as a black woman, as a black person, period. And with this that came up with social media, folks that said that they were so liberal, all about spirit, all about all kinds of stuff. And I'm going to open up another can of worms with this, but I'll wait for it. I see so many posts that are so borderline and, 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 and sometimes so downright racist. And I sit and I'm like, you have, you're 70 something years old. 
not senile and you post this with quote unquote black, Hispanic, Asian friends on your page and you don't think someone's going to be offended and get mad. And I'm like, that is so insensitive. So you want to speak your truth. But when it doesn't affect you, like I said earlier, when you have, when you're, it's a boil and it's there, no matter whether you want to acknowledge it or not, and you won't address it, when someone goes to lance it and now you're pissed because you're hurting or someone offends you or makes you uncomfortable, you got to deal with it because it doesn't go away. Um, Just, you know, constant, constant. There was someone, bless her heart, that had posted having to do with, you know, here in Richmond, having to do with Richmond, um, a piece on whether it was a visual, well, it was a meme and something else, I guess it had an article attached to it, whether the Statue of Liberty was going to be the next statue that they, quote unquote, they are going to attack. A whole bunch of her friends jumped in and said, oh, they, they this and they, they that, and I'm reading all these comments, and she's like, yeah, yeah, and being kind of neutral, but she put it out there, and she did not clarify nor speak her quote-unquote truth. So what that said to me was, I'm trying to make a point. They are attacked in all of our stuff. And if anyone doesn't know what I'm talking about, we're talking about the fact that in Richmond and in a lot of different places, particularly here in Richmond, Virginia, they have been pushing and tearing down Confederate statues on one of our wonderful, beautiful monument avenues, uh, our, our tourist sites. And people are pissed off about that because they say leave history and let it be. But when it's a history that tells a certain group of people, we were going to keep y'all to to beep beep. You know, that's me, that's me, um, <laughs> that's me cleaning up my words. We were going to keep y'all as blah, blah, blah until these darn Northerners came across and messed up everything. Because I've heard it being called the war on Northern aggression. <laughs> Not what it is. It's so true. when she made that post, she was very insensitive. And when her friends jumped in with the days and the this and that, and she did not speak her truth as I thought she meant to do, it further stated that I am comfortable with being racist. I am comfortable with attacking and being very passive aggressive in it. And that's why I said that constantly you have to consider that some groups have to constantly filter out whether things being said or done are done in malice. I was going to say, um, we, it's the same issue here in Alabama. So I'm, I'm just shy north of Birmingham and you know, there's a lot of history of, you know, desegregation, Martin Luther King walking in Selma, uh, across the bridge in Selma. We have tons of statues. Um, fortunately, we, so we do have two sides to that. We have the people who, I mean, it is taught here in our textbooks that it was the war on Northern aggression, <laughs> um, that they were trying to preserve their way of life. And so it's ingrained in them from early education, like they're indoctrinated into it. Um, and so I could see how it's hard to change their point of view. Um, fortunately, we have some of, the, our, of our statues are coming down and have already come down, uh, thanks to Mayor, our Mayor Woodfin who, um, in Birmingham, who was just trying to call out, he was just trying to stop uh, violence. Like he saw it coming. And so this was, I'm, I'm sure as soon as it gets to the courts and the courts open up, that they might go back up. But as for now, at least, you know, there was a stop put to it. But I think um, for me, like the, the whole visibility thing, um, it, it's interesting because um, growing up as a child, so I'm Asian, I'm Korean, um, part white. And so you'll see me as whatever you feel comfortable seeing me. Uh, but growing up, I had, most of my friends were black because the white community did not embrace me as well uh, because I was very different and they didn't know why. Um, so I didn't know any different growing up until I'm older now. And since everything going on in the splits with the protests, what side are you going to be on the riots happening? I'm trying to speak my truth about everything, but then also I'm, I'm trying to give everybody space because I want to hear where they're coming from. And then I feel like as I'm reading some of these posts, some of the people that I thought were my friends, and these are POC and black women and so forth, uh, people that I grew up with saying things like, oh, I'll, you know, and especially because COVID, um, we've been in quarantine, businesses are closing. They're like, oh yeah, the Asians are moving out the nail salons and stuff now. It's time for us to take our space. And they've been taking our money and screwing us over. And I'm like, well, hey, wait a minute. <laughs> like, 
we're friends. Like, I, you know, and I, I don't understand where all that is coming from as well. Well, I think for me, I'm, I'm, most of the days it doesn't bother me. I'm in my animus world. But when I go out into the mainstream, I do feel harassed. I feel like I'm pressured to make a choice and that between who I'm going to support. And that means that if I choose this side, then I can't be with that side. And that feels like you're trying to tear me apart. You're trying to draw and quarter me. Like which part of me am I going to embrace and which part of me am I going to tar and feather? And I'm not willing to tar and feather anybody. I look at my right. family and I love my family. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't look white either, but I, I don't say this often and I don't say this in a way that I think most people would mean it, but I'm white. My grandmother is white. She is me. I am her. And that's a part of me. And I'm not going to deny that. And, and to do that would just, I, I think it would, would actually just break me apart. And I think that's part of the problem. I think when, when slavery happened, this is just one aspect of it. I mean, it happened to Native Americans too in a different way. But when slavery happened, these people were brought over here, torn from their roots, torn from their language, torn from their religion, from their families. And they weren't given a blame that. So you've been in this new homeland for all of these years and you're not a home, you're still not home because the, the people in power don't see you. Mm -hmm. And you know, the Native Americans, same thing happened to them. They had their language taken away, their spirituality taken away, and they were made illegal basically in their own country. All right. So All right. yeah, are they disenfranchised? Yes. So I think the root of this, it's really not about hair. That might be the thing that we're focusing on today but it's about belonging. People need a place to belong. I want to look at you and see myself reflected back in your eyes as something that I see myself as. I want to see me reflected back. Mm -hmm. And if I see nothing, or if I see hatred, or if I see worthlessness, that creates division. You know, I think a lot of this is about seeing people as a threat. It, like Marva, like you were saying, if everybody just wore their hair, whatever, it wouldn't be a threat. It, nobody would be talking about, oh, well, you can't wear your hair that way. It wouldn't be right, a conversation. Right. So, so ultimately, for me, it comes down to, can we just love each other for who we are without being threatened by it? And mm. it's hard when you have all these people throwing bombs at you every day. Oh, well, you're not, <laughs> you're not bad enough. And you're, you're not right. protesting enough. And you're not protesting the way that I want you to protest. And I can't believe you said that when, you know, you're just like, oh my God, what did I say? <laughs> <laughs> well, Laura, I'm going to, I'm going to go ahead and stoke the fire a little bit. You know, it's all that fire in my, my natal chart. I'm just going to go ahead and lean into it. When you spoke about, um, you know, I know you're a mixed race and so forth. It brings me to mind as something long before this, all this upheaval came about that I had always found interesting. Um, and in regards to the first people, the Native Americans, because just like black folks, you had to go through that whole change of what can we now call them our, ourselves or what now? African Americans, colored, black, Native Americans, first people. <laughs> I recall, especially, um, moving further up north from South Florida into Virginia, I recall to me a phenomenon that, that was very interesting. Meeting a lot of folks that claim to be Indian or partially Indian and who honored their roots and that was wonderful, but it was so interesting to me. And this is before I really had, I, I heard it and I, I think I knew it, but it didn't come to the forefront. I was like, but these people are white. These people ain't Indian. What? Wait, wait a minute. You know what I'm saying? Okay, so I will say the gist of the point, maybe because it's babbling too much. Moving further up north from South Florida, one of the things I thought was interesting as a grown adult, seeing so many people that appear to be white to me start saying that they are, are Native American or of Native American heritage. Me coming from a mixed background, also, I was, I'm aware that you don't, what, what appears on the outside doesn't mean what's part of your heritage, especially in very close, your close ancestry. But I also felt that there is a word, and I, and I don't mean to offend anyone, but it is a real word that's used all the time. There's, there was a whitewashing of that. Knowing that there was a point in time that, that Native Americans were being married with white people so that the children came out more white, mm. deliberately. Am I correct? 
I don't know about that history, but I can tell you that uh, I think some of that's going on because of self-loathing and people yeah. don't want to be associated with the oppressor. Uh, I think right. that is just, uh, so when, when this is a really interesting part of American history that I don't think a lot of people know, but when um, the Jamestown colony came, part of the reason they had it like, such a hard time getting it established is because the, the settlers would run off and quote unquote go native because they appreciated mm -hmm. the lifestyle much better. And this lasts for a long, not just Jamestown, this lasted for a long, long time. Um, and they couldn't understand why, and it never went the other way. It wasn't like the natives were becoming, you know, wanted to embrace the, the settler's lifestyle. And I think that there is a yearning for freedom, for inclusion, for family, for animism, and even modern day people, that when you have that, and when you see that, you're just like, oh my God, this is what I want to be. And so that's how they right. identify. Yeah, I got to go camping ever so often, or I'm a little bit off kilter. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's go ahead. that I see that, you know, and, and this happens today too. There's this longing for this, this connection and this, this animus lifestyle. And yet it's the very thing that people will also destroy. Right. You know, when you're coming yeah. in there as tourists and you, you, the, the, you bring in the Western lifestyle, you bring in the Walmart, you bring in the, this and that. And I, I saw this in um, North Carolina a couple of years ago, maybe uh, at a native reservation. And I was just, I just wanted to cry because the, the infrastructure, the foundation of what made it animus was so hard to find. Mm -hmm. Right, right. So this is, this is, you know, like you said, at the root of it, if we could all appreciate our, you know, for who we are. There is a movie that my brain is struggling to remember. Uh, Tom Hanks was in that movie. And, and, and uh, that lovely black girl, lady, I cannot remember her name. Anyway, it had to do, oh, 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 oh it was a very good book. In the end, it was about if we came to a point where most people were mixed and you could not tell <laughs> what background you came from, do you guys, Cloud is Atlas. it Atlas? Cloud Atlas? Is it Atlas? Cloud Atlas. Cloud Atlas. Yes. Yes. Read the book, did the movie. Um, and so I looked at the movie and like, wow, if we came to that point, how would you feel to lose, you know, dark melon skin, to lose fair, fair skin, to lose olive colored skin? How would we feel? And some people have a deep fear of losing that identity, <clears throat> which I understand. The, the, uh, the thing that I find interesting when I was touching on meeting so many people that appear to be white and said that they were Indian, when you now are, um, when you are, when you're not in touch, like you said, with what the true culture and history is, but you're claiming it because that had been done so much. Mm -hmm. I'm aware, I mean, I'm aware of quite a few who, you know, I know they had to pass a law that if you're not X percent uh, American Indian, you could no longer claim it for tax exempt and so forth. It's, it was like, how do you strike a balance with keeping in touch with what you, what you feel spiritually or in your heart is part of your heritage versus what you look like in the society you live in? Are you doing it just to make a point? Are you, uh, you know, just to stand out? So how do you strike a balance? Are you doing it, like I said earlier, about that actress? Was she doing it just at the time because it's going to get her more likes on social media? Or did she really appreciate getting her hair braided or she thought she looked cute? Um, or was following the trend of that chick that we won't call her name if we're not allowed to? I don't know. <laughs> Kardashian, you already said it. Anyway. <laughs> One of the reasons why I don't uh, go around advertising, I'm talking about it now because of the racial stuff, but generally speaking, I don't go around advertising my ethnicity. It's none of your freaking business. I want right. you to see me right. as an individual. And if you see me as whatever, if you see me as somebody that you respect, great. Let's, let's deal with each other on that level. And I really, really hate having to say, well, I can say this because I'm blah. You know, I don't want to have to legitimize myself because of my color. If I'm making sense to you, then let me make sense because what I'm saying is logical or it has some truth to it. So 
All it's right. funny because that you mentioned the cloud atlas thing because I never noticed that about the skin color. <laughs> <laughs> in the <laughs> end, in the very end, all the kids, everyone was mixed except for Tom Hanks. <laughs> if you I looked at it, it they were trying to say something different. But <laughs> yeah, it was like everyone. If if everyone was mixing, now we'd be that human race, but you wouldn't be able to tell quite what you are. And is that okay? Yet for some people. You know, you had that rule, one drop makes you black. If your eyes are a little slanted, then you must have Asian or something in you. Uh, um, by the way, Sherry, I didn't want to lose something I wanted to touch on with the folks, especially African-Americans, or we'll just call them blacks in general, talking about now they're moving out, we can move in. Mm -hmm. I will say this. It is a hurtful and it's a mean thing, because I got a lot of black friends that talk a lot of shit. You might have to go ahead and filter that out of this podcast, but they talk a lot of shit. Very hateful, very Afrocentric, said they're, they're reclaiming their African roots, which is the other thing I wanted to touch off, so I'll go get there soon. Just let me know if I'm running out of time. <laughs> but one of the things that I know that has been experienced, you have, in America, we, we do still have segregation. We still have all these issues that are, that are implemented by specific groups because safety in numbers. So when you go into black communities, you know, there's been times, and, and I, again, I'm not trying to offend anyone, but let's just, we're going to be truthful. We have we can be truthful. We can speak our truth and we're going to, we can lay it out, right? So <laughs> I will tell you this. As people who come from different minority groups, as the three of us, have you noticed that there was, generally an accepted minority group that went along with every era. You know, you look at TV, there was a time you had to be Asian to be the tech guy on a TV show, right? You had to be Oriental Asian. And now you have to be Indian Asian. And, you know, there's a different group and different group. Oh, if you're going to be a mad scientist, you have to be a German descent or Russian. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's like we put people in those groups. So you look within the black communities and you look at things like, okay, and this is touching the nerve, but it is part of truths, right? It's, it's a part of realities. You see a lot of, for example, 7-Elevens run by some type of Pakistani, Indian, or Arab, or of that color group. And you can never quite put your finger on it unless you ask them. You look at nail salons and you see Asian, whether, and I think a lot of them are Korean. The thing that was, that, that pissed a lot of folks off, and I could say that me coming from the Caribbean, knowing that I grew up with people speaking different languages, French, English, what people call Pato, just broken English. I could speak like I'm from the Virgin Islands and people, you know, People will have to translate. When you have people who are frequent in the business, there has been a lot of times, and I was aware, because you can tell by body language, you can tell by, you know, you don't have to speak the language, that, that the, the, the folks running the shop were talking shit about their customers. And that just set off stuff, you know what I mean? But there were no quote unquote black nail shops because the prices or whatever, or the expertise was within that community. And there were more. And so you had that nerve being touched. You also had it where just like many other businesses that came after segregation from minor, other, other non-black minority groups that went into the community because they had an opportunity. They had the money, they had the finances, they were willing to take the risk, but they did not blend. They did not accept. And that's where the anger still is. You could have uh, uh, um, an Indian or uh, Arab store. I think Spike Lee touched on in one of his movies where it's okay to have the store, make the money, do everything. Don't mix. Don't come home with any babies. And one of the Spike Lee movies, and don't ask me which one, because you can see I'm not good at remembering certain details on certain things right now. Um, it was a problem because the store owner found a young black lady very attractive, and he was genuinely attracted to her. And other people said, oh, he just wants to screw her. It's just about sex. But he was genuinely attracted to her. And his people were pissed off, but they owned a business that thrived in the black community. So you have that, what we were talking about, Laura, you know, you could be okay with yourself, but when you're okay with yourself to the point where you think there's a problem, if your bloodline mixed with another race, with another culture, and we do this within the races, you know, uh, one Asian group doesn't want to mix with the other one, one black group don't want to mix with the other one, the old joke in the Caribbean, don't mix up a Puerto Rican and a Cuban, God forbid, don't mix up a Puerto Rican and a Dominican, <laughs> you know what I mean? But now there's a whole lot of mixed babies, but there is still a, there was a time and there still is. And that's where I think people 
um, are still, it's a raw nerve. And, and just like everything else, that, that boil is being lanced because people are now looking at it. Um, I, I, you know, I wear my hair in all kinds of different styles, weaves, wigs, braids, all kinds of stuff. And I go to a, a, a hair store that's predominantly Korean. I was surprised when I went to one of the big department stores talking to one of their makeup artists. And I said, oh, I went to so-and-so store. And they're like, don't go back there. They're both racist and they are um, uh, uh, homophobic. And I was like, oh, you know. I don't have I don't have that experience with the homophobic part, and I didn't think I had a problem with being racist. I went in there. I've seen white women buying different products, and I've seen black women, but I know the majority of their business is black. But I also noticed it may be a family-run thing, but there 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 didn't seem to be an interaction, a personal interaction with me as a black woman. It's always just customer and or anyone else, and I frequented it enough as where there is another Korean run well it's just a very mixed store on the uh, not on the other side of town but on you know further away where the family is white korean and the child or the grown adult child is mixed black and white they're a different breed <laughs> and they're personal they talk with you they call you by name they know their customers and and so forth and that's where that animosity comes but yes black folks can be just as pissed off or just as racist and foolish about it i don't think it's good or healthy to go to any extreme but when you live with it day to day and you're not accepted when your money is accepted but not you that's where the problem begun and where it continues where is the reinvestment where is the joining do you own a home in this community where you have your business would you dare send your school your kids to school with the people that put money in your pocket and that's where some of that foolishness has to be addressed and 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 dealt with because you can't you know it's kind of like colonialism isn't it? Is it maybe a, I'm sure somebody's already come up with this, but it's almost like a business colonialism. I'll go in, I'll pull out the resources, you know, which is money and so forth. But I will not make an investment in there unless I'm 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 doing it for me and mine. Mm -hmm. Well, I do know in this country we've had a history of pitting. So when Asians. Um, so in Korea and a lot of Asian countries, they're, they're still very homogenous. They, they haven't had a lot of, um, it's changing now. Like I see more and more people over in Korea and Japan and, and so th the, the, there's changes happening. So I, you know, I, I kind of understand the, the lack of experience with other races, other cultures, other skin tones. Um, and not knowing anything about them. But then also, I, I don't understand not asking questions and getting to know them. That's, that's painful. But I know when they come over here, so this country's had a history of, so when, you know, you had the riots, and well, even before the LA riots, um, the U.S. was kind of sort of pitting Asians against the black, the black community. Because when they were giving out these programs with all the immigrants coming in, they were saying, oh, well, look at the Asians. They're being obedient. They're following the rules. Why can't you guys? Why can't right. you do this? Why can't you do that? So I know that's created a lot of animosity between these communities as well. Right. And, and Asians haven't really been, I would say they have, well, so the younger generations have been building bridges and, and trying to close those gaps too by, um, sharing cultures and food and living in the same neighborhood. So I, I do see the changes happening. I, I, I just see, I still see the issues with the older generations. Um, and I think like with everything, we just have to wait, you know, wait that out. But I, I do see the younger generations making the changes. I'm so proud right. of the young people that have showed up at the protest. I mean, there's no oh. people too, but you know, they're just like, oh, we are not having this. <laughs> I mean, they grew up in a time where LGBTQ, you know, love who you want to love. And, and they were just like, whoa, wait, wait a minute. <laughs> so I've been to um, three protests. And I just, I just, I think there's, there's still some things that young people need to learn, but <laughs> their passion for equality is fantastic. <laughs> mm. Right. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw this in, and this is still a work in progress. Being uh, Black and being from the Caribbean and, you know, 
knowing that a good bit of my ancestry came through, uh, came to the West through slavery and so forth. My my background as I know it so far, and I could be corrected in the future, and I welcome it. <laughs> what we know of my family line, and I just shared this uh, um, uh, with Laura, a little bit of an awakening, because I'm about to switch a little bit of gears to the other issue, I think, uh, that's, that's definitely uh, an undercurrent that's boiling up when it comes to all of this animosity and dealing with stuff and lancing our wounds spirituality and background and so forth. So on my father's side, as we have it, the known history from those who are holding tightly onto their secrets, my grandmother is Asian. On my father's side, my grandfather is black. There were indentured service, there were people who had you know, gone into the Caribbean from Asia, okay? You're not gonna be able to see it on all of us. Some babies just come out light, some babies came out dark, some came out with eyes and they're like, hmm, you know what I mean? Uh, my father, sister was supposed to be very fair skinned and probably took more after her mom and he, he was more meloned and tanned very well. And with my mom, my mom was very dark skinned and uh, there was a nickname, I don't know, it might offend people, I forgive me, but this is what they called her back in the day when people were still being culturally or racially inappropriate. They called her like a black coolie for her long hair, her smooth, smooth, dark skin, and her brownish eyes because they couldn't put their finger on her quite and say just black, okay? On her father's side, her, her great-grandmother, her father, I get it mixed up, was Irish from the island of Montserrat, where whether you want to argue they were indentured servants or slaves from the, uh, the atrocities that happened in Ireland. Uh, and I was at least able to trace back that family name. So that's just what four or five generations back. And that side of the family directly, most many of them are fairer skin, lighter color eyes, and so forth. So when I say background multicultural mix, it's not just because uh, I'm saying, oh, the slave master slept or raped or whatever. I know my family's got some mixing. And my father's parents didn't have anything to do with some history. That was just people finding each other sexy. <laughs> and, and, you know, and when you're, when you're brought together, um, as one of the members said on, on, on the post, when people are just thrown together after a while, if the foolishness that I wonder, and we can go streaming off into this this train of uh, conversation, if we're just not wired to be so difficult with each other and, and so forth, because most of what, what we're talking about is visual. When you recognize something is different from you, do you accept it, do you embrace it, or do you feel that now I need to preserve what's like me? That bad monkey brain, that reptilian brain or whatever, are we not just wired to be difficult like that to preserve whatever these differences are? Um, and where I was going with all of that, <clears throat> so just to say that's my background. I'm a, I would consider myself way more spiritual than, than religious, and I'm still digging out those minefields. You have so much colonialism in spirituality. And so this podcast being what it is, I know you guys can appreciate that. There is also a big upheaval with blacks and different groups saying, hey, we in this country, in the West, we, we need to put our belief systems on the table and, and allow it to be equal. Um, a lot of the, 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 the foolishness that we've also heard coming out of the modern politics with certain groups uh, supporting Trump or supporting certain idolisms, they've used religion, <laughs> you know, Christianity and whatnot as justification. And I'm like, is that not a slap in the face of other belief systems? Because one of the things I brought up in my very metaphysical, very conformist, bless their hearts, well, on, on, on the surface of conformist churches, and it, it, it touched off a little bit. There was a promise to do something about it, and it never came up. I, I asked, why is it that within the metaphysical community, the general one, the one that's now big and popular and spreading like wildfire on TV and movies and, and everything from the mystical to the spiritual, from vampires to, to different beings and all kinds of stuff, only a touch of them have ever and still acknowledge the African religious belief systems outside of Egypt. And even still, I don't think, huh? 
I think it depends on which which uh, who you run with. I'm not seeing that at I, all. I'm seeing actually they are quite. Different. Well, it's where you go. Yeah. Like I said, mm -hmm. I you know I go to a Unity Church and I have visited so many Unity Churches and I've gone to so many of their different little programs. Oh, not, not all of the United States. I've I've never seen one that acknowledged African religious beliefs other than Egypt. And and still I go to a lot of different spiritual groups around town and almost all or a very large percent of them, when they bring up anything African, it's usually having to do with I'm not talking Muslim, I'm talking about African, African, not not from the um, Arab Isle. Because I know there's a lot of Muslims and Muslims and so forth and Islamic stuff in northern Africa. But I'm talking about um, the Western and the different tribal belief systems. Yeah. Even in shamanism, um, I've listened to programs and very rarely do I hear any of that. But okay. even when I hear about, can you hear me? Yeah, I think you're not black enough to be invited to those. <laughs> and I'm saying that as a joke because I see them. I see them. They're, they're, well, I think also because so many of them are undercover. I do have friends who are initiated into this culture and so forth. And you're right. Some of them do not because they don't think I'm black enough because I'm West Indian. And if I am not all right, you know, I can't, you're over and so forth like that. If I, if I won't walk around all day long wrapping my head in white or wearing a different color or so forth, um, or a dashiki or a modern version of it, yeah, I have friends who are, and they have all kinds of celebrations, and I don't really get invited to a lot of them because I am not. And, and, and so that's the truth. But when I brought that conversation up within my church and so forth, they were like, oh, we can, we can, and so forth. And I looked at it. Okay, so one of the things that I, 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 I had found, I still find irritating within the spiritual community, certain ones, when they bring up, I'm talking about the metaphysical or neo-metaphysical community, so I won't claim it, because I know you guys are very in touch with a lot of deep people, but there are a lot of shallow folks out here claiming to be metaphysical, and this is what I hear. Oh, okay, well, you know, I'm celebrating the God, we're talking about the goddess so-and-so, and she was so-and-so in, in, in Egypt, but she was also known as so-and-so in Greece, and in England, she's da-da-da, and I'm like, whoa, 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 how did you just take an Egyptian goddess and turn her white? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I understand archetypes, but I hear it constantly, especially the older Anglo and white whatnot generations, constantly. I, I studied some shamanism with someone, and every time I brought up something, and it, did, it was not even a black something, it could have been an animal, they turned it into a European goddess mm -hmm. or god. And I'm like, what the hell? Mm -hmm. So it's not just Christianity, but I think that there's a bad vein of that going through the metaphysical community so i'd like to have your feedback on that because i i am a little ticked off about that <laughs> i think that's a great conversation for another podcast because i have some ideas on that one too <laughs> so let's say actually, oh good let's, let's save it for another time because actually we're out of time uh, yeah but <laughs> okay. i think it's a great uh topic and um but for now <laughs> let's close by sending gratitude to the elements and our loving helping ancestors for being here to both of you and me for being here <laughs> and thank all our listeners for joining us for this edition of the modern animism radio program uh, i'm laura giles for pan society radio and we'll see you next